can you go from standing to a cross-legged position on the floor? And back again. Can you drop down effortlessly into a deep resting squat without warming up? And from here, can you then shift your weight onto one foot and then stand up like a pistol squat? Can you drop yourself down into a deep Cossack squat, again from cold, and then transition to the other side? And can you then twizzle into a nice deep Spider-Man stretch on the spot and switch sides? So hopefully some of you guys were able to do some of that stuff, but there's probably a large portion of you that couldn't do much of it. Maybe couldn't even get into a deep resting squat. And I'm not saying all this to make you feel bad, although you should feel bad. Jokes, you should not feel bad. I'm not saying this to make you feel bad because this is normal. I'm just pointing out just how little movement we get in our lower legs, how much is left on the table untapped because my hip mobility and my hip strength they're not even great. I've actually got an injured left hip right now and my hamstrings, my calves and my hip flexors are all still too tight, contributing to pain in my lower back. I'm undoing years of damage, in fact. I have been making an awful lot of progress in that area though. My point is that most of us are so seized up in our lower bodies, we have so much dysfunction down there and a lot of it is to do with our hips, to do with not using our hips. And this makes total sense when you think about the ways that most of us train in the gym. Most of us restrict our leg training to squats, maybe some lunges, maybe some deadlifts, and perhaps some hamstring curls and leg extensions. But all this is doing for you is it's training you in a very narrow range of motion. We're only squatting halfway. We're only moving in the sagittal plane, up and down, forwards and backwards. We're not rotating the hips. We're not moving side to side. So that's only part of the problem. The other problem is that we spend the rest of our time when we're not in the gym, sitting. So we're either in the gym, moving in a limited range of motion under heavy load, or we're sitting down. And I've talked about this so many times, I won't go into great detail, but your hip flexors are shortened, your glutes are being squashed and weakened, your hamstrings are shortened, and you sit there for so long, sometimes eight hours a day at work and then more hours when you get home, that this almost becomes your natural position. You get so good at sitting that you now struggle to stand and walk. Get that anterior pelvic tilt, meaning that hip flexors are pulling on the pelvis, tilting it backwards and sticking your butt out behind you, compressing the spine and making normal movement difficult, making squats and deadlifts actually dangerous. This is a recipe for injury. This can lead to a complete lack of hip stability, meaning that the knees are much more likely to come out of alignment, causing injury. Weak hips are one of the number one complaints among the elderly, leading to falls and even more severe injuries. Ignoring the hips is a huge mistake. Training your hips could also lead to huge improvements in your deadlift, your squat and more. Internal rotation is particularly important when it comes to getting out the bottom of a squat. And yet, if you want to see just how overlooked and neglected hip training really is, take your average bodybuilder or powerlifter, put them in a Pilates class and see how they do with their side-lying leg raises. These are extremely strong, powerful people, but they'll be sweating and shaking when it comes to just lifting their own legs sideways. And I speak from experience here. My friend and I attended Pilates classes at university back when I did only traditional weight training. It was a cockamamie scheme to try and meet women. Did not work in the slightest, especially when they saw how bad we were at these basic movements. So let's go and take a look at what we can do to fix all that, shall we? It's time to stop ignoring the hips. The hip is a complex joint that can move in a variety of ways, including flexion, extension, internal and external rotation, adduction, abduction, and any combination of these together. So as I already alluded to, many of the biggest issues with our hips come from sitting too long. Being in any position for too long is no good, but sitting in particular has some specific negative consequences for the body, particularly affecting the hips and the lower back. Those tight hip flexors and weak glutes mean that you have uneven tension affecting the pelvis. This creates an anterior pelvic tilt. In other words, the top of the pelvis tilts forwards, the back sticks out, and you get what's called Donald Duck butt. This creates compression in the spine and can cause lower back pain on its own. It puts you in a weaker position for lifting and performing a host of other movements. It leads many people to forget how to properly hinge their hips. They literally can't, meaning they're lifting with their lower back. And it weakens the glutes, meaning that you can't drive as much power into a range of athletic pursuits. Fortunately, there's some fairly easy things that we can do to fix this issue. 
Essentially, you want to stretch the hip flexors and create more mobility there. And we want to strengthen the glutes and teach ourselves to perform the proper hip hinge movement. We can do this with a number of different exercises. Stretching out the hip flexors, you have things like Spider-Man stretches. You have the ATG split squat as promoted by Ben Patrick. You can also strengthen the hip flexors, and it's a myth to think that strengthening them is going to make them tighter. The strength of a muscle is not linked to its mobility. If anything, having stronger hip flexors will help you to get more comfortably into that position because you'll have more control in that range of motion. Your body isn't going to seize up thinking that you're at risk of injury. In terms of regaining some strength in the glutes and relearning the hip hinge, one of my favorite movements is the glute bridge, which I've talked about recently on this channel. I also find Kettlebell swings, really fantastic for strengthening the glutes. Once you learn the hip hinge movement, this is a great way to not only ingrain it with high, high repetitions, but also to really strengthen the glutes so that you have that power and you can push through them and perform athletically. Get that what the hell effect. Eventually you'll find that you develop such mind muscle connection that you can actively hold the pelvis in place and push through using the glutes. This doesn't come right away though. And you might find that sometimes as you're trying to train and improve this area, you're actually moving in the wrong areas so you really need to focus and take your time with this. Don't try and push yourself too far too fast and if possible, have someone check your form. One tip that I didn't share in my glute bridge video that really helped me is to lift my legs up and then push them down. I imagine like I'm running. This way it becomes one continuous movement where I'm lifting the legs and then pushing through them rather than having to try and think about engaging just that part of the leg as I'm performing the movement on the ground. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the opposite problem the dreaded butt wink. Butt wink is what happens when you get into the very bottom of a squat and you actually get a posterior pelvic tilt, meaning that it's now going to tilt backwards, bringing your tailbone right underneath you and rounding the lower back. This is relatively normal and unavoidable for some people, particularly right at the bottom of a very deep squat. So you shouldn't worry about it too much. But if it's happening earlier in the squat and or if you're piling a large amount of weight on your back, this then becomes a risk factor. You're at a biomechanical disadvantage, more likely to injure your lower back. Like I say, in some cases, this is unavoidable and we'll address that in a moment. But for others, this is due to tightness and lack of mobility in the hip area that can be addressed. So one common explanation is that this is caused by tight hamstrings and that by stretching your hamstrings, you can thereby combat and eliminate butt wink. This, however, isn't quite so simple because you see the hamstrings actually attach at the tibia and fibula below the knee. This means they're not actually getting any longer at the bottom of a squat. And so you would think that a lack of mobility here wouldn't cause an issue. It's very much still worth training your hamstring mobility because it does create tension when you stand up and perform a host of other movements, but it also could still affect your squat to an extent. Because when you think about it, coming out of the bottom of a squat, you're engaging the quads as well as the hamstrings. These are opposing muscle groups, so you'd think movement would be impossible. This is called Lombard's paradox. Good old Lombard. What's actually happening here then is that the hamstring is lengthening at one end and shortening at the other. So while it's not probably one of the biggest direct causes of your butt wink, it is possible that stiffness here could be limiting your movement and contributing to that issue. There's loads of options out there from your typical pancake stretch to Jefferson curls to all sorts of other stuff. One thing I will say is that if you're trying to touch your toes, this might actually be encouraging you to round your lower back. You don't need to touch your toes in order to stretch your hamstrings. You just need to bend forwards. You know, Tom Merrick, the bodyweight warrior, has a YouTube channel full of fantastic stretches for the hamstrings and many other aspects of your hips. I highly recommend going and checking that out. I actually got to meet Tom at the start of the year. I was a guest on his podcast. I also went in a horse box that was turned into a sauna, as you do. It was awesome. So I'll leave a link to that in the description down below if you want to check it out. What's probably more likely for a lot of people is that you have a lack of ankle mobility. When you get down into a deep squat, if you don't have ankle mobility, you're going to be leaning backwards. And the way you counter this is by hunching over forwards. Otherwise, your center of gravity is often gonna tip backwards and fall over. So we need to address the ankle mobility so that the hips can function the way they're supposed to and we can keep our back nice and neutral. Again, there's plenty of great stretches for the ankles. A really nice one is to get into a deep squat, find a surface you can hold onto in that position and then gently pull yourself forwards. This is great because it's very specific for what we're trying to do here. It'll train your squat at the same time as training that ankle mobility. You can also get into the bottom of a deep squat holding a weight in the goblet position. Another great one is a calf raise where you lean against a wall with your legs out behind you, keeping your body and legs straight. This way, when you get to the bottom of the calf raise, you're gonna feel a really nice stretch on the calves. But unfortunately, the last possible cause of your butt wink is one that we can't do much about. You might find that your hip sockets are simply too deep. This means that as your femurs flex, they're actually gonna push on your pelvis and tilt it automatically. There's not much you can do about this. 
unfortunately, one solution is to widen your squat stance. And by doing this, you can actually find more space and get deeper. This is gonna require more flexibility in the hips in other areas, such as your abduction and your rotation. And that's what we're gonna address right now. Hip abduction, baby. So why is hip abduction important? What is hip abduction? Well, hip abduction is moving your legs apart like that from the midline. Hip adduction is moving them back together again like so. One way I like to remember this is that one leg is being abducted away or you're adding them back together. Hip abductions we've just discussed can help you get into a deeper squat because it opens up space for you to get lower so that your pelvis doesn't hinder your movement. At the same time though, strong hip abductors and adductors give you stability. They provide you with support when you're pushing off of one leg. This is important whether you're a sprinter exploding off of a starting line or whether you're a martial artist delivering a roundhouse kick. It can also help to prevent falls and trips and this becomes particularly important as we get older. This is why I highly recommend movements like the one-legged good morning or the anterior reach or the one-legged Romanian deadlift. These are all similar movements that have you hinging your hips and moving forwards whilst balancing on one leg. And by keeping all your joints stacked, you can also reduce your likelihood of injuring your knee or injuring your ankle. Something worth mentioning at this point is your footwear, which can affect many of the things we've discussed. If you wear shoes with a big heel, for example, then this is going to shorten your calves. Why do you think that you struggle to get into that position in the first place when it should be such a natural movement? At the same time, if you've got a narrow toe box and this is gonna give you a less stable base to balance on, this, of course, is why I wear barefoot shoes, minimal style shoes. These are from Brevo Barefoot, who are today's sponsor. I'm a huge fan of barefoot shoes, as you guys know. I've been talking about them for years, and I'm super excited to now be working with Brevo Barefoot. I think they make some of the very best barefoot shoes in terms of comfort, durability, appearance, choice, and they're shoes that I feel I can wear to nearly any situation. Genuinely, having worn nearly exclusively these shoes for three years, I would find it extremely hard to go back to regular footwear. It feels restrictive, painful, uncomfortable. By using the link in the description down below and code Bioneer15, viewers can get 15% off of a pair of Vivos. At the same time, there's also a link down there to a video course from Vivo Barefoot on trail running. The course is taught by Jenny Tuff, who's a runner and an adventurer, which has to be the coolest job title ever, right? This teaches you the basics of trail running from mechanics to things you're going to need. And as you guys know, I made a video on this recently. I highly recommend trail running. Not only is it a great way to make a regular run much more interesting, but it also trains that hip stability because you're running on uneven ground, especially when you're wearing barefoot shoes. I highly recommend trail running. This course is a great way to get started. And once again, code Bioneer15 will get you 15% off. At the same time though, we also just want to make these muscles stronger so that we can push out more and squeeze in more with more control. And we want to increase our mobility in this area so that we can do things like the middle splits or high head height kicks or drop into that deep Cossack squat. The muscles responsible for hip abduction include the glute minimus, the glute medius, the tensor fascia latte, and the piriformis. The piriformis runs from the lower spine diagonally to the femur, passing underneath the glute and it actually has the sciatic nerve running underneath it and through it. So this is a potential suspect if you have lower back pain, if you have inflammation or irritation in this area. For improving strength and mobility in the abductors, we can just do side lying leg raises, just lie on your side and lift your leg up. You can make this a bit harder by adding a resistance band, for example. Or alternatively, you can use the side plank, and the side plank is great because it'll also strengthen the quadratus lumborum, giving you further hip and spine stability in that frontal plane of motion. For the adductors, if you want to strengthen that movement, then you just want to do the opposite. So you can take like a yoga ball and put it between your legs, squeeze it between your thighs like that Bond villain, or alternatively try the Copenhagen plank. Here you're going to lie in a sideline plank position with your leg on a bench. Only one of your legs though, the outer leg, meaning that you need to push inwards, create adduction, and hold that in a static position in order to keep your body nice and straight. For mobility in the abductors, you can hold a horse stance. I made a whole video on that recently and make it gradually wider and wider. Another option is a sumo squat, or even of course, just attempting box splits and holding that position as wide as you can go. Another one I really like is the prayer squat. You get into a really deep squat, put your hands together, and then gradually push out with your elbows in order to open up the legs even more. And while you're there, you can pray for greater hip abduction. But hip abduction and adduction don't tell the story all on their own. You also need hip external and internal rotation. This is the ability of the femur to rotate in the hip socket outwards or inwards. 
This is really important for a host of things. Once again, it plays a role in the squat. When you get into a deep squat, you're often gonna find that you have a little bit of external rotation as you allow your hips to drop through into the middle, and then they need to internally rotate as you stand back up. So weakness in this area can contribute to weakness in your squat by strengthening this area that might seem boring on the surface, you can actually get a bigger squat. In some cases, it's actually the opposite way around, especially if you try and keep your feet pointing forwards more, then you're gonna experience a little bit of internal rotation potentially at the bottom of the squat. They're gonna to need to externally rotate as you stand back up. There's individual differences here as well, but the point is that however your body works and whatever form you choose, you're gonna need internal and external rotation. This becomes even more important for something like a roundhouse kick, particularly if you wanna do more flamboyant kicks like Grant does. Again, there's plenty of great stretches you can use to do this. I highly recommend an Instagram account called Vanja Moves. She has some fantastic ones and really makes this stuff look extremely easy. I'm still learning, my mobility in this area needs some work, but some I've been finding useful include the 90-90 stretch, which is a classic. Place your legs down on the ground so that they're both at 90 degree angles and then lean slightly forwards. You can alternatively just sit cross-legged and then gently push your knees down to the ground. The side squat is a great starting one as well, a great way to train the legs whilst also getting a little bit of rotation and abduction. I also love the Cossack squat. Keep your back nice and straight if you can, keep the heel flat on the floor. Holding weight can once again act as a counterbalance, allowing you to maintain a better posture whilst also getting you deeper into that squat. Something else to experiment with that can improve mobility, strength and control in pretty much every plane is leg lifts. You can lift your leg in a controlled manner directly in front of you. You can lift it out to the side. It's worth mentioning at this point that in general, practicing movement is what's the most important here. For example, if you took up dance classes or martial arts classes, something that challenged you to move outside your comfort zone or just practice these things on your own, then you're gonna naturally find that you improve your range of motion in these areas. So the more you move and the more variety you give your body, the more you'll find you naturally maintain that movement and avoid dysfunction and injury. So there you go guys, that's a fairly comprehensive look at how to train your hips in terms of mobility, stability, strength and injury prevention. I've gone for breadth rather than depth here, so if you want to learn more about some of these stretches, some of these exercises, then check out the videos on my own channel that I've recommended and some of the other creators I've recommended. I truly believe that hip training is something that so many people could benefit from. It's missing from so many people's training and I think it leads to a huge amount of dysfunction and injury, as I've tried to emphasize throughout this video. When people talk about not skipping leg day, they're talking about not skipping heavy, heavy squats. And to be honest, most people, unless you're interested in powerlifting as a hobby, don't need that kind of strength in that limited range of motion and just in the sagittal plane. Most people need to be able to rotate their bodies. They need to be able to balance, throw kicks, avoid injury. They need to be able to squat down easily to play with their kids and grandkids on the floor. And then to be able to stand up from that position without getting everyone around them to give them a helping hand. And this is why I think that just training strength is not a total solution for your fitness. You need that mobility, just like you need cardio and mental health and all those other things. So yeah, don't neglect hip day. Don't skip hip day. I also have a training program, that Super Functional Training 2.0, the Protein Performance System. That includes a bunch of the exercises we've discussed here and many more designed to improve not only your max strength, but also mobility, stability, flexibility, and all kinds of other stuff like cardio and decision making. Because I think that fitness shouldn't just be about simply improving strength, simply losing weight. If you agree, then check that link out in the description down below. And there's a summer discount on right now. Either way, guys, thank you so much for watching this one. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.